Well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Ian Nanayao Adubudu Keduku, also known as the Black Batman Bruce Wayne with the tan, also known as the pigmented Peter Parker, also known as the darker Tony Stark. Um, I'm a poet, multimedia artist, and I'm living in Toronto, Toronto, uh, which some of the original caretakers of where I am are the Haudenosaunee, the Métis, the Mississaugas of the New Credit, and the Anishinaabeg. Um, the event is being put on and sponsored by the Rose Brampton. Uh, Brampton is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit under Treaty 19. And that this is the traditional homeland of the Wendat, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee nations. We also acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, Inui, and other global indigenous people that now call Brampton their home and would like to honor the indigenous people's past, present, and future that continue to work, educate, and continue to strengthen our country. To learn more about the history of Brampton and Treaty 19, I invite you to watch the online segment where author and historian Jesse Thistle reads the treaty in full and talks about how it came to be. You will be able to find the link in the chat box. We also want to uh, acknowledge the grateful support of the Canada Council for the Arts, the Writers Union of Canada, the Ships Company Theatre in Parsboro, Nova Scotia, and of course, uh, to all of you for coming on out. I want to introduce our guest artist for the afternoon, morning, evening, wherever you're coming in from, but this is the reason for the season. Elizabeth Gen Glenn Clope Copeland is a writer, theater artist, and arts educator whose work over the last four decades has evolved at the intersection of arts and activism. Performance credits include touring with Second City and with the Honolulu Symphony. As an artist facilitator, she has worked and completed a number of school-based residencies and has taught at the San Miguel Writers' Festival and the Knowlton Literary Festival. Her writing has appeared in Resilience Magazine, Deep Times Journal, and Forge Journal, amongst others. In 2014, she won the W. FNB 2014 YA Fiction Award, as well as the Ken Klonsky Novella Prize for Jazz. In 2017, she's accepted a writer residency, a residency at the Joggins Festival Fossil Institute, jumping at the chance to spend in spend time in the presence of 300 million year old rock formation. You know, I don't know anything uh, that old. The oldest thing that I can think about is uh, probably myself, but you know, that's incredible to spend some time with uh, formations that old, to even think of yourself within that time lapse and that time span, quite incredible. What followed for Elizabeth was a two-year odyssey that took her down into the heart of her own eco-despair, forcing her to examine what it really means to practice what eco-Buddhist philosopher Joanna Macy calls active hope. The result was a book of narrative eco-poetry called Daring to Hope at the Cliff's Edge, Pangea's Dream Remembered. It was just a while ago that I met uh, the wonderful Elizabeth and I am constantly floored, amazed and inspired by both her work as an artist in various realms and various genres and also her work as an activist and how she's been able to bring these two together. Uh, the book, Daring to Hope at the Cliff's Edge, Pangea's Dream Remembered, is a wonderful symphony of discussions around climate change, around uh, the human condition, and how we can move forward, not only as a prescription, but as a hope, a faith for all of us. And so in this spirit, I welcome you to welcome me, and so we can welcome all together Elizabeth Glenn Copeland. Yeah, we do these hands. These are my uh, 
ASL clapping hands. I love it. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Hey, Ian. Thank you. I, I love that introduction. It was so full of spirit and spunk. Bravo, my friend. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I mean, it's uh, completely your doing, uh, your, your resume in so many different parts of the water. But uh, hopefully today we could talk a little bit about the water, bodies of water, the body of water that inspired um, your, your, your wonderful book of poetry, Daring to Hope at the Cliff's Edge. Um, but first, I just want to hear a little bit about where you're from, where you're calling in from. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'll take a minute just to riff off on, on you, you, the title of the book. And, and here is the book, Daring to Hope at the Cliff's Edge. Here's the beautiful Joggins Fossil Cliffs and the, the 300 million year old rock that Ian was referring to. So where we are right now is um, along the Parsboro shore. And 300 million years ago, this was at the heart of the supercontinent of Pangaea. Um, Pangaea contained all, most of the continental land masses that we know of today. And where we are now was equatorial rainforest at that time. I also want to acknowledge that where we are here on the Parsboro shore is on their traditional homelands of the people of the dawn also known as the Mi'kmaq. Um, the Mi'kmaq signed treaties of peace and friendship with the British Crown in 1725. And these treaties did not deal specifically with um, uh, giving away the title for this land. The treaties established the rules for what was meant to be an ongoing friendly relationship between nations. So it's always important to remember that in Canada, we are all treaty people. I'd like to just provide a little bit of context. So Pangaea was a supercontinent. Pangaea is also Greek for one earth, one earth. And yes, this um, odyssey that I went through to write this book did take me down into the bowels of my own eco despair, but it also took me deep, deep, deep into the indescribable wonder that I have felt um, since I was a child, high up in the arms of the weeping willow that in some ways parented me in ways I don't know if I would have otherwise survived. So it allowed me to feel this gratitude for the incredible nature of the living world that we're a part of. And this deep respect and wonder is now being expressed in multiple life-affirming movements across the globe from small local rewilding projects to the movement towards regenerative economics to Diana Beresford Kroger's incredible bio plan for the global forest to the earth jurisprudence movement in Africa, which is seeing vast swaths of once desecrated land return to lush green. And the earth is that resilient that she can do that. Um, along with some of these mo movements, the cultures that have inhabited these lands have also been regenerated. And I'm talking about the indigenous cultures and the allies that are with them. Most of us don't hear about these movements in the mainstream, which is so addicted to the story of business as usual. But I know for me, um, in my work, they provide me with well streams of collective joy, allowing me to remember that if we come together collectively, we can create what is truly possible, which is the potential of our evolutionary heritage. So dare you be, my friend. Can I read you a little bit of the poetry right now? Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> I, I, I really love the fact that uh, you, you talked about how uh, the East Coast used to be rainforest. I feel like if that was the case today, so many people wouldn't be going to Cancun and Florida. We'd just be headed off over East. We'd that's incredible. Be, yeah. Well, it's, it's incredible to look at a map of Pangaea and see that all of us, and Brampton too, would have been we're down by the equator continental rainforest. So um, if you know, at what, what would, so now it's, you know, Nova Scotia area, but what was connected to it? What broke off and, and where is that now? 
oh, well, the continent split. You know, Africa went down there and South America went over there. So it's a great thing to do. Google the map of Pangaea. Pangaea. I would recommend that. All right. May I begin? We're ready. Friend? Yeah, we're ready. All right. So um, one of my challenges to myself as I wrote this book is I wanted to, I've always enjoyed um, reading uh, long narrative poems, you know, and so we think back to the Odyssey, that was a long narrative poem, and I wanted to experiment with the narrative form in this book. So um, the poem that is in this, in this book is a 69-page narrative poem. So it ha it's broken up into five sections, and the first section is called Riptide Supplications. And I'm just going to share a few little excerpts from Riptide Supplications. Rock. You are called an abiotic, non-living component of the ecosystem, along with sunlight and clouds. But if that is so, why, when I am in your presence, am I so moved? I have read about you in books, observed you in various seasons, talked about you in the abstract, but what if I could still my chattering mind long enough to hear your voice? Your deep and abiding quietude lends such phenomenal grace to this place that my breathing body longs to know you, to animatedly converse through you with the mystery of the primordial earth, of which I am but an ever so small but critical part. I am an earth-honoring woman of European descent. I am not native to this land. Of my ancestral lineage with all creation, I know little. The knowledge I have gathered is pitifully small, gleaned from books and old women and pure dumb luck. Like Audrey, I know the master's house cannot be raised with the master's tools. Like Richard, I want to hear everything and nothing at the same time. Like Lawrence, I am waiting for a rebirth of wonder. Autumn equinox, dark and light in equal measure. September 22nd, 2017. I awoke before first light to news of children in cages, centuries old rages rising up. Sirens scream, Syria burns, and an old growth forest is cut down to make toilet paper. Markets thrive while species die, while the planet's oceans heat and rise, heat and rise, heat and rise. Against this rising tide of mainstream malevolence, can anything I say or do matter? It is dawn at the Grand Najagan, and the beach is strangely still. Fog hangs gray and heavy at the base of the cliffs as millions of microscopic water droplets ascend slowly heavenward. I watch a peregrine falcon circle overhead, listen to the animated conversation of blue-black ravens huddled high on the fossil cliff, see myself small in its shadow. The tide is out, no water as far as the eye can see, 
only small creeks like tiny capillaries fanning out into the fertile mud flats. A flock of laughing gulls float gracefully on soft gray, black-tipped wings. A few late-to-migrate piping plovers fly in perfect formation, their underwings flashing bronze as they plunge earthward to feast. A Sobeys bag caught on a sharp-edged piece of driftwood makes a crackling, crinkling sound. I rip it down, stuff it into my pocket, try to banish the image of a whale washed up on the beach in Thailand, his guts full of plastic. I walk south towards Ragged Reef, past layers of 300 million year old sedimentary rock set at 20 degree angles by almost incomprehensible tectonic forces. Trace the steps of Lyle, Dawson, and by extension Darwin, founding fathers of the earth sciences that rocked the world with their upstart theories. Light from the rising sun reflects gold on the cliff face that stands silent, somber, sublime. I raise my arms high and wide. The second day of the Roman festival of mania the portal between this world and the underworld is open. October 5th, 2017. It is mid-morning, and as the wind begins to rise, the mighty fundy shifts and sighs as 150 billion tons of water, heavy with salt, ebbs and flows in common time. In my pocket, my iPhone buzzes. I've got notifications. I block out all stimuli. The hop, skip, hop of the wild sponge rolling down the beach, the laughter of the gulls as they wheel and dip in the gray-blue sky, the full-bodied bouquet of seaweed and salt and fertile decay. Instead, I stare at the screen, hoping for tidings of great joy, but instead see that someone I don't know has responded to a comment that someone else I don't know has commented on in a message that someone I wish I didn't know has tagged me on. Or is it in? Whatever. Scrolling down, pictures of Rohingya Muslims fleeing terror. The President of the United States throwing paper towels to hurricane victims. Kim showing off her new manicure to Kanye. High on the cliffs, drying goldenrod and saffron colored grasses waltz in the breeze. Anxious to accelerate accomplishment, I join in the dance. Not a waltz or a sway or a two-step, but a furious fandango executed in the style of highly successful white people who value speed over all. My heart a dervish, my monkey mind whirling in a hundred different directions, I clap, skip, and step my way over slippery stones, looking but not seeing, hearing but not listening, dancing faster and faster and faster until my breath comes in scorching gasps. Falcon cries high overhead, her marigold eyes catching fire. Gee, gee, gee. Wisdom from Rilke slows me. Only when we tarry do we touch the holy. I kick off my shoes. Watch as they continue their frenzied jive south to Apple River. Turning to face the cliffs, I kneel on stony sand. A chattering fugue of fossil seekers moves on to the beach. A little girl, seeing me kneeling 
and probably thinking me an old woman beached, runs to my aid. As she helps me to stand, she sings. The more we get together, 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 the more we get together, the happier we'll be. <laughs> Can it be that simple? Thank you so much. I think that's what we all needed on this Sunday, wherever you are. Uh, such a beautiful evocation of spirit and place and atmosphere. And it also tied us to some of the more contemporary moments that, uh, that we think about. Can you tell us a little bit about your relationship to uh, the space, to the Bay of Fundy? And uh, perhaps, do you remember your first time there? I do, I do. Um, we drove out here with my family. I think it was, I believe it was in 1967. Um, so I think we went to the event in Montreal um, and then we came on out here. Uh, we were on our way to Prince Edward Island to, to you know, spend some time at a cottage, but my father was desperate to see the Magnetic Hill. So we took a special trip out to Moncton to see Magnetic Hill. So I would have been about 10 at that time. So that's my first, uh, first time meeting the mighty Bay of Fundy. Do, do you remember any of the feelings or the thoughts that you first had or maybe any of the aura? I think at that time I was eager to get to PEI and, and jump and go right. swimming in the beach in the water. Um, I thought Magnetic Hill was kind of cool, but I was really focused on Anne of Green Gables, I'll be honest. Oh, uh, yes. I was a, a huge classic. Anne fan when I was growing up, so yeah. And how many times, General Borough Park, do you think that you've been there since? I hadn't been there until we, um, Glenn and I moved out to the East Coast in 2011. And we actually tried to buy a house in Hillsboro, which is right along the Bay of Fundy um, in the, on the New Brunswick side. Um, there were some things wrong with the house, so we didn't end up living there, but um, we did take a trip into Fundy National Park, which is so beautiful and was really um, stunned, in fact, by the majesty of this, of this scenery. I'll ask Christina right now, maybe you can put up um, the photo of the Three Sisters Rocks, just so people can get a sense of just the majesty of this yes. land. Yeah, so what, sh what you're looking at now is, um, are the Three Sisters Rocks. And this is in Chignecto Provincial Park, which is near to where we live right now. There's an old Mi'kmaq legend about the Three Sisters that back in the day, um, when Glooskap wandered this land, they were shapeshifters, but they abused their power. And because they abused their power, um, Glooskap turned them into stone. Mm -hmm. So when I was visiting the Three Sisters ro uh, Rocks as I was writing my book, they said, your kind has abused their power and you are lucky that Glooskap is still asleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, what I found interesting about um, the book, but also the pieces that you read from, was an acknowledgement of your positionality. Um, you sort of reference uh, your European ancestry, but the book also, for me, kind of serves like a literal land acknowledgement. Um, what sort of navigation, um, provocations, thoughts did you think about when thinking about the land as a physical being, but also as part of the living legacy of Indigenous peoples here in Canada? Yes, yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, so for me, um, my own studies and, and personal practices in um, the earth-based traditions, which are my Celtic heritage, 
have given me um, roots in what might appear to a lot of people as a, as a relatively rootless life. I've moved around so much, I'm a traveler, but these traditions have given me roots. So when in um, 2018 uh, and 2017, actually, I spent some time at Mount Allison University studying indigenous ways of knowing with Dr. Paulette Steves, who is a Cree Métis scholar, brilliant woman, um, read her book, it's just come out. Um, and I really saw that the deep, there was a deep resonance for me, that similarity with what my own practice has been and indigenous ways of knowing. So it, on a personal level, that really spoke to me. Um, I also feel very strongly that indigenous ways of knowing are our last great hope in these times that we live in. I'll say that again. I, I believe that indigenous ways of knowing our, are our last great hope. So I really wanted that to be part of, of this book and, and um, thank you for what you, what you said. It um, helps me see that I was mildly successful there. There's, just, there's an element of understanding the reciprocity that we as humans have with the living earth that we are not the dominant species, the only ones who are alive, that the whole earth is alive. And in fact, we rely on that reciprocity. I love how many indigenous teachings um, remind us that unlike the great chain of being, which we, you know, most of us learned about, about the medieval time where humans are at the top and everything else is below us. Um, according to many indigenous teachings, we are little brother and little sister in creation. Hmm. And we are allowing our teachers to go extinct. Hmm. So I love the reciprocity. I love the reverence that nothing is taken from the land without first asking and then acknowledging and honoring what has been taken. Um, there would be no clear cutting happening with, with, that, um, with that form of reverence. And also just the, the, um, the call to joy that I feel when I'm in the presence of, of Indigenous teachers. Even though there's great struggle, um, there's a sense of I'm alive and, and the joy that comes with that. And we do need, I believe that to be joyful in this day and age is a radical act. Mm. That does, I'm not talking about spiritual bypassing, but to right. really be joyful. I'm so joyful that I'm here with you today, Ian. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm so <laughs> joyful. And there was one line that really uh, touched my joy bones. Uh, it's by the funny bone, if anyone's wondering where the joy bone is. It's near the heart. The joy bone's connected to <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Is the line, only when we tarry do we touch the holy. And I thought that that's so incredible because of the juxtaposition, the idea of you know, we have to, we have to dig our feet deep within the purpose to reach the peak or to reach the, the summit. And when we, when I think about the book and, um, and I look at the texture of the book there, I feel like there is a lot of reaching, like we haven't got there yet, but there's a hope uh, for lack of a better term, you know, there, there, there's, there's, a. Uh, there, there's a, there's a hope, a, a joy, a, a faith um, that we can do it with some determination, with some uh, collective responsibility. But I also see that sort of action and behavior towards reaching visually as well. Some of the pieces kind of uh, mimic a sort of visual biomimicry where we see the words create uh, the physical atmosphere through which you are being inspired. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your process of being in the space, thinking about the language, but also thinking about the language in a visual way, in a representational kind of way. Yeah, do you want to throw up on the screen um, the, the, the JPEG of rock? So this is the first poem that's in the book. 
And of course, you can see that I created it in such a way that we can see the, the shape of the rock as it appears above the land. And we can see the energy of the rock that, that is below as well. And I, I played with this in various places um, throughout the work. I find it's a wonderful way to, um, in a healthy way, disturb the reader. Mm. Right? Because we're all used to having far too much information come at us and our eyes are, are used to moving left to right, left to right, line, 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 up from the bottom to the top. So I wanted to do things that gave the reader's eye a rest from that habitual way of being with, with language and, and um, set it in a way that also gave them a sense of the flow. I know I appreciate that. There's a particular Mary Oliver poem that I love where she uses just the way she has set the, the poetry on the page it gives me a sense of the flow that she's also created with her words. So yes, thank you for observing that. I'm wondering uh, if uh, you'd do us the honor of uh, giving us uh, a couple more readings, some more work. Yes. Um, I know I know everyone in the chat is really hungry for that. Just a reminder, uh, if uh, you have any comments or um, words of inspiration, things that moved you, lines that you want to remember, make sure yeah, you put them in the chat. Linda says, we must learn to receive life gratefully and return it graciously. Thank you so much, Linda. Very beautiful. Yeah, thanks, Linda. All right, so before I do this, I want to introduce you and I'll, I'll ask you, Ian, to just put up quickly the pictures of the birds. So we're going into the second part of the, um, of the book right now, which is called The Language of the Birds. And there were um, three uh, different bird species that presented themselves to me when I was beginning this work and asked to be part of it. So first up, we see the peregrine falcon. Um, falcon was almost extinct in this part of the world. I believe it was until the mid 80s, um, almost extinct because of the use of pesticides. Um, they were reintroduced in the mid 80s and um, they can be found in this area. Falcon is the fastest bird on the earth. So if you get a chance to make some friends with falcon, please do. Um, let's, let's jump to Raven. So Raven, of course, in many different cultural traditions, is, is, it has great wisdom and is also a bit of a trickster. So of course, Raven had to be involved. And last but not least are the laughing gulls. I knew because I was taking people quite deep and into some darkness that um, I needed to have a little bit of comedy. You know, if you, if you read Shakespeare, sometimes in his tragedies are the most, the most funny characters. Right, so when we're dealing with difficult things, we need some lightness and some comedy. So the laughing gulls uh, serve that purpose. All right, thank you. So this is from part two of the book, The Language of the Birds. And it starts like this. The language of the birds was considered a secret and perfect language in many alchemical traditions. Though history has hidden the names of many of those who paid the price required to learn this magical tongue, some of their stories were hidden away in the folds of fairy tales, as, is, as it is in this rendition of a classic tale from old Russia. Once upon a time, there was a young man named Ivan who had a perfectly unselfish heart. He lived with his elder brother, Dmitri, and his father, a proud and wealthy merchant. One fine spring day, Ivan's father tells his sons to go out into the world to make their fortunes. The brothers set out, and as night falls, they find themselves walking through a dark forest. Suddenly, Ivan hears a cry of distress. He runs from the path deep, deep, deep into the forest towards the sound and finds at the base of a giant oak a baby bird fallen from its nest. He gently picks up the still blind creature 
tucking it into his pocket, then scales to the top of the tree where he returns the baby to his mother's nest. Overcome with gratitude, the mother bird offers to teach Ivan the language of the birds. Spring turns to summer and Ivan stays in the forest, intent on his learning. Only when the leaves turn from green to orange does he set out for home. Along the way, he meets his brother who boasts of money and women and the name he made for himself at the gambling tables. When the brothers arrive home, they proudly recount their stories. The father orders a fine feast to be made for his eldest son, but banishes Ivan to the barn. As the moon rises high in the still night, an icy rain begins to fall. Shivering with cold and fear, Ivan hears the barn swallow tell him that all will be well, that one day he will save his brother from execution, rescue his father from poverty, marry a clever princess, and become a wise and benevolent king. Yvonne's story has many twists and turns, replete with high adventure involving pirates and talking crows, and I encourage you to read it in, in its entirety. But the upshot of the story is this. When faced with trials, Yvonne calls on his bird friends and thus saves himself and many others from great suffering. The language of the birds was considered a secret and perfect language in many alchemical traditions. It was also known as the green language. Spring equinox, light and dark in equal measure. March 21st, 2018. Fundy is dawned in an almost Caribbean blue as preparation for Easter's day dawns bright and sunny. Think egg, estrogen, the fertility of bunnies. I hip hop down the beach, slightly manic to the consumption of too many chocolate eggs. After seven weeks of mindful listening, I am Peter Cottontail's wife in full and ecstatic estrus. I shout out to the cliffs. Sandstone, siltstone, and shale, on behalf of my kind, I need... The shrieking of raven high overhead overwhelms my voice. Need, need, need! You humans, always coming to us with your never-ending needs! The family of laughing gulls swoops low, makes an offering of good luck, a dollop of gull poop. It lands on my glasses, runs down my cheek. Stifling the urge to gag, I wipe it away with the back of my gloves. <sighs> oh, great cliffs, I need... The largest of the gulls interrupts. Lord Tundren, don't you know anything about approaching your elders, girl? She's 300 million years old, for God's sake. Now take off that stupid feathery hat and introduce yourself proper-like. I do as I'm told. Um, uh, my, my name is... In a sweet voice, the smallest of the gulls says, Um, excuse me, missus, excuse me, um, but, but have you brought us anything to nibble on? I'm sorry, I don't have any food, but hey, stop that. Ugh, more poop, this time from the whole family. I blunder backwards, lose my balance, land hard on knot rack covered stone. The air rings with mocking laughter. <laughs> oh, la dee da. She's some funny, eh? <laughs> what an arse. <laughs> Finally, some comedy. I roll onto my side. 
Check to see if there are any other humans on the beach to witness my shame. I grab a handful of drying dulse, wipe my face clean, and find myself drawn to examine the knot rack's tiny grape-like bladders. I marvel at the tracks of marine snails, the gray-white barnacles, the shiny sea stars. Falcon glides down from the rock ledge, landing on his sturdy yellow feet. He arches his neck up as if to show off his notched beak, his elegant eye rings. We regard each other. He cocks his head right, then left. Each up. I shake my head, not understanding. Each up. You are doing well. Don't give up. A tide of euphoria floods me. Falcon, the wanderer, the fastest bird on earth, has spoken to me. Thunder rumbles in the distance, rumbles, then cracks. Far out over the bay, a fork of lightning arcs from a purple-stained sky. Then cumulonimbus lets go, first a drizzle, then a pewter-stained cascading curtain. I stand up, and like Tim Robbins in the Shawshank Redemption, I arch my back, open my arms wide, sing out my gratitude on a single sustained note. The rain soaks through my clothes and into my pores. I feel my cells merge with some unnamed yet nevertheless intoxicating wonder. No longer estranged from my sensing body, I have no answers. Only reverence. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. You know, scientists, they talk about um, mirror neur neurons in our brain. So uh, these are uh, neurons that make it feel as though when someone is reading a story that we are within the story ourselves, that we are the person, uh, the protagonist in these stories. Um, I just want to share a quick uh, photo that was sent by uh, Carrie, uh, which I think really speaks to the vibe that we got going on right now today. Hold on one sec. So we've got uh, we've got us on the on the on the Zoom life, and then obviously there's uh, a joy either stamped or tattooed uh, right in the middle on a hand exactly where it should be. <laughs> Yay. Yay! Beautiful. I really en enjoy the uh, the personification that's happening in in. Uh, a lot of uh, what you just read, um, the anthropomorphization as well. Uh, but, you know, this idea of you screaming to the sandstone and the shale and uh, hearing back from uh, the air, which I assume is Irish. Uh, I love I love the <laughs> characters in your forward of, uh, uh, of of your book. You talk about as a young child, a moment where you uh, went up to a weeping willow and you spoke to this uh, weeping willow tree. Has this always been a practice for you to uh, speak to the inanimate or perhaps you, you, know, you see them as more animate than many of us do? Do they speak back? And when you're around in, uh, in nature, in the environment, what do you hear? What do you see? What is coming back to you? What is that sort of symbiotic relationship which you so well articulate uh, in these poems? Yeah, that's a, that's a lot. And um, 
I think I always felt a relationship with the world as animate. When I was a little girl, I remember my, myself and my friend Marion um, would spend a, lo a lot of time sitting up in this. It was an old weeping willow that had been split in half by lightning. So one half served as a bridge over the creek and we would scramble um, up into the tree and sit there and there were things in my in my home life that were were difficult and I would spend a lot of time there by myself and I always felt this love from this old weeping willow and I also felt surrounded um, by the presence of all the other living things that were in this field. I mean, I, I feel at my age, I'm, I'm really called to bear witness to a kind of aliveness in the natural world. And, you know, this has happened just in, I'm just 63, in the course of this lifetime, I can bear witness to a kind of aliveness that I know many young people have not had the opportunity. There was the, the sounds of the natural world, the buzzing of the insects, the, the massive uh, wildflowers and, the, and the, the, the butterflies and the damselflies and the dragonflies and the great big fat raspberries and blueberries. And you go out there and have a feast. Um, so I've always felt that sense of, of being in touch, I guess, with the living world in that way. Um, in terms of how I hear it or see it, it's certainly not the same as how I hear you or, or how I see you. So nobody needs to call the man in the little white <laughs> <laughs> um, But it just comes when, I'm, when I can get quiet enough what needs to what what wants to be shared with me comes through um, what needs to be shared with me visually I see it again it's 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 a different use I think mm -hmm. we all have these different ways of using our senses that um, you know business as usual culture dominant culture doesn't want to encourage in us because then we would reclaim the power of our imaginations and with the power of our imaginations we are collectively powerful. Right. So I, f I feel like this sort of idea of collective power is incumbent or, you know, a prerequisite or inspiration for us to um, activate this collective power comes in that listening, that different kind of seeing, that different kind of interaction with the natural world. I'm wondering, you know, within the book and within your work um, as an artist and an activist, there's a lot of intersection. Um, do you find that there is a relationship between the climate movement and let's say the BLM movement or the queer rights movement? Um, and if so, could you speak to that necessity to understand the climate or the climate crisis as intersectional? So all of us, whether we're working to um, end anti-black racism, um, rape culture, um, to stop the massive clear cuts, you know, the abundance of other things that we're fighting for, we are all essentially fighting for life, life in all its fullness. And um, Sometimes I see this, you know, I think of Yeats's poem, William Yeats, William Butler Yeats is uh, the second coming. And, you know, it ends with that line, the beach, the beast slouching towards Bethlehem to be born. Of course, of course, Yeats uh, foresaw this way back when, as many incredible poets have and, you know, gave us warning. Um, um, sorry, I'm... Uh, so much is coming to that wants saying, and I'm, I'm, I, I must, uh, I'm, I'm just going to listen for what wants to come. Yeah, we're here. Yeah. So all of these things, all of these clear cutting, anti-black racism, rape, all, all of these horrible things, I see them as something that has the same toxic root, hmm. right? So the way they manifest in the world, 
is in different ways, but they have the same toxic root and they are like the hydra of Greek, the Greek myth, right? So the hydra had many different heads and I think it was one of the 12 trials of Hercules. He had to, if, you could, if he could cut off the one head that was immortal, he could kill the hydra. But I see it, I, you know, it, it, it's, like, it's like a hydra. So I do, th I do believe that they have common roots. Yeah. It has a common root, and it's a toxic root. Yeah. Well, I hope that. Does that answer uh, your question? Does that speak? To absolutely. That? You know, yeah. I, you, I, I, I'm not sure if any of us have the definitive answer as to, you know, how do we solve these things? How do we uh, cut off the head of Babylon? Uh, but I think that collective responsibility is important. I think the things that you talk about in regards to listening, um, Beth in the chat says collective power through collective imagination. So I feel like art, inspiration, love for each other, love for the natural world, listening more, listening better. Um, uh, Alan says the toxic root is ego, you know, removing the ego um, as much as we can, I think helps us take steps towards uh, that idea of, you know, uh, reaching the holy, if, the, if that makes any yeah. sense, yeah. Yeah, and riffing off what Alan just um, brought up, it goes back, you know, I think about what, what transpired in the late medieval days into the age that we, we call the enlightenment. And there were some enlightening things that happened in that time, but mostly there was a lot of women that were burned, gay people, gypsies, Jews. There was a lot of horror that was, yeah. that was set in, in the time of the Enlightenment. Um, so, so tell me what Alan said again. He said ego, the toxic yeah. root okay, being so ego. I, yeah, so what I wanted to, to just throw in there is the idea that during that time, we went from the idea of being a collective, more of a collective, to the great I, right? So the great individualization. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that there weren't some good things that came from that, but it's, it's gone too far. It's gone to the point that we have forgotten that the, the reason that we survived when we first stood up on two legs with, you know, we weren't particularly fleet of foot. We had no teeth. We had no, 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 no big, no, no, nothing to really defend us. Was that we understood that it is in our collective power. It is with each other, our connection with each other. And dominant culture would keep us all in these little groups of people where we cannot experience our own power with each other. So this is about reframing what power is, that it's not power over others, it's power, it's our power with each other. Um, a friend of Glenn's wrote to us a, a year or so ago and was said, don't so much think of trying to move the mountains as to fill the valleys with song. Mm. Don't try to move the mountains, fill the valley with song. So I, at this point in my in my activism, in my art activism, I'm not so much interested in looking at how do we go up against these great behemoth systems that are based in the great eye and then based on hoarding. And if a small percentage of people have a lot of stuff, that's fine. I'm interested in exploring how we recreate that collective we. Right. Where we really have our power and where we can start to pull our energy from these toxic systems. We can't get away from them, but we can begin to pull our energy and localize, strategize our efforts. It reminds me of um, this South African uh, philosophy called Ubuntu. I am who I am because of who you are. We are who we are because of who we are. Um, and this idea that, uh, yeah, I think it's collective responsibility in, uh, in a beautiful phrase. Um, we have just about 30 minutes left. We're gonna stay um, an extra 10 minutes after for some extra questions, but I'm wondering if uh, we could have perhaps one more reading. Yes. 
Um, hmm. Whichever direction or vibe you want to go in, we're here for you. Okay. All right. Um, all right. These, these two poems are not from Daring to Hope at the Cliff's Edge. These are from a new chapbook that I have written called um, Floating on Magma. And so there's two poems here, Keys to the Treasure and What the Young Queen Knows. Ostara, the goddess of spring, in a last ditch effort to rouse us from our consumer trance, is playing the role of Corona, the second century saint who died a martyr's death as the golden age of the Roman Empire waned. Corona, inaccurately named by some as the saint of pandemics, in truth, she is the saint of treasure hunters. And though there will be death in these times, maybe even my own, there are treasures aplenty to be found by those with eyes to see, ears to hear, the willingness to open to the subtle instincts of the instinctive collective psyche. Over the centuries, saints and sages, shamans and singers, and singularly gifted women have offered us the keys to the treasure, drawn maps written with their life's blood. But we, stubborn children, well trained to hold disdain and so abstain from all that is of the liminal, enigmatic, weird world have ground the key under our heels while writing shopping lists on the back of the maps. And so, as the oceans heat and rise, heat and rise, heat and rise, we dance drunkenly forward like Pinocchio, following that weasel lampwick to the empty treasures of Pleasure Island while in the darkness stirs. What the young queen knows. I am coasting on a surge of stress hormones as waves of intersecting crises begin to crest. A quiet voice reminds me not to impose my own ideas on what is unfolding, to stay as soft and flexible as possible, though the urge is strong to constantly analyze, criticize, infantilize. I want to run to the city where the pandemic rages, Take my only child in arms that ache to hold her, whisk her to safety, but where is that? Meanwhile, outside my window, under the vaulted sky, as night falls and the early autumn winds begin to blow, a young queen bee settles herself at the base of the petals of a sunflower. She is listening to an ancient wisdom, which she never fails to heed, that tells her that winter is coming, that she must rest to gather strength for what lies ahead. Similarly for me and ancient wisdom, which I am only now just learning to heed, tells me that the road ahead is filled with known and unknown dangers and to be as agile and flexible as possible for the good of all my relations. I too must rest. 
And so, as the winds of change howl and moan, in the pause between calamities, sitting cross-legged on sacred sacrum, I think of the young queen, close my eyes, and in the silence, silver energy streams silent, burning, soothing burned out circuits. Sounds of horses' hooves galloping over hollow hills. A childhood dream where danger comes and lo, I can fly. A river of calm and I expand into forever. In this surreal night, I am the space between the stories, the weeping of the mothers, the singing of the tides. <laughs> ah, what the young queen knows. Thank you. I feel like we have, there's so many quotes that uh, I feel like maybe some people in the chat are gonna, once pandemic is over, they're gonna go to their first tattoo shop, their closest tattoo place and be like, uh, right across my forehead, I'd like to put, I expand into forever. That's, uh, that's gonna be my new tattoo. So amazing. Thank you so, so much. Uh, there's a lot of uh, beautiful comments. Uh, Glenn says, that was amazing. Beth says, wow. RL App says, very nicely done. Tara Francis says, um, is is a Mi'kmaq artist and uh, says in, uh, in Mi'kmaq, to all my relations, uh, oh, oh, uh, Elizabeth, thank you, essentially was the, uh, was oh. the uh, vibe. Uh, so restorative, beautiful, Heather. Uh, so what, we're going to get to uh, some of your comments and your questions, but I'm going to put on my Oprah Winfrey hat right now real oh. quick. Mm. You know, I hate to do it, but I love to do it. And I think we have a specific <laughs> uh, scenario which allows me to get a little bit deeper and to, uh, you know, talk a little bit about your personal life. And, um, you know, I want to give you the liberty to speak as much or as little as you want about it, but you have such a interesting, incredible family. This is like, you know, Canadian legendary artistic family. Um, your partner, Beverly Glenn Copeland, uh, is a Canadian music legend um, he, as a songwriter, as a performer, as an activist. Um, I personally know him, well, not personally, but I am aware of him from his work as a regular actor and performer on Mr. Dress Up. Um, just as early as a couple of weeks ago, they were featured in the New York Times. So it's a really incredible, acclaimed artistic family. I've always had a difficulty trying to navigate two artists in the same house, uh, let alone uh, the ability to talk to each other about their about their works. Uh, what has this relationship been like? And could you give us a little bit of insight to, uh, you know, keeping up with the Copelands, if anything? Oh, wow. Keeping up with the Copelands. OK, honey, that's our next show. I love it. <laughs> Um, we have, um, it's not really a registered production company, Glenn and I, but we, at some point we do want to register it, register it. Um, it's called Under the Wire Productions because it means most everything that we have done in our time since our, we got together in 2007 as a, as an artistic couple, as a, you know, uh, two people who love one another has always been under the wire. Right. You know, it looks like we don't have enough money to pay the bills and then under the wire it comes in or, We've got a vision for a, for, a, for a show or for an event and it doesn't seem to be coming together and then under the wire it comes in. Um, 
So yeah, Under the Wire Productions. Um, I think the universe was trying to get Glenn and I together for a very long time. I first saw Glenn um, at the Groaning Board restaurant on Jarvis Street in Toronto. When I was 19 years old, I went in there with my friend Marion. They had an amazing, it was a groaning board, amazing food. And we walked into the groaning board and there up on the stage was this person. It was very hard to tell what gender, um, in a track suit, I think, um, playing the piano and singing with very little interest about the audience. There was no like, how you doing out there? Or <laughs> there was a, did you have any requests? It was like, I'm playing up here if y'all want to listen, that's good. Um, so that was when I was 19, when I was pregnant with my daughter Faith. Um, a friend of mine came to me and said, oh my God, you have to hear about Beverly Glenn Copeland. Have you ever heard this artist? And I said, no. And she gave me a tape with two of, um, two of Glenn's songs. And I remember one of them was uh, sailing on the winds of time. Mm. Let me take you to sailing on the winds of change. Oh, nothing else is on my mind. So I, you know, I was singing that song. Oh, and yeah. Going inside <laughs> of me. Um, and then we met in 1992 um, through um, just, you know, societies of friends, musical friends, artistic friends, uh, spiritually based um, communities, and became friends in 1992. And we have a little funny story we like to tell one another, which is that we didn't see each other often, but when we saw each other, Glenn would always download what was like the deepest in his heart. And Glenn's a very private person. He doesn't, he doesn't let people in to that kind of stuff. And he forgot when we met at our friend Maggie's wedding in 2007, he'd started telling me things. And I said, no, no, remember you told me that when we were at that cafe on Young Street? Remember you told me that? So we got together at our friend's wedding in 2007 and we got married in 2009. Since we've been together, um, we, we have been collaborating. We, we entered into our first collaboration shortly after I moved up to Muskoka to be with Glenn. And um, we ran a theater school in Miramichi for five years and wrote a number of um, musicals using um, a collaborative method working together we've had to learn um we've really had to learn about each other's rhythms right we have very different rhythms and at first that made our working together difficult we often had to you know it was a little bit a little bit um, edgy sometimes i have a i'm a very fiery thinker and when ideas come to me, they come, I, they, they're like a huge, they come in a great pattern. And I see that, 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 and this person and the, these textures. And I want to bring in that artist. And it's like, it's like, it's like a fire. Glenn is more like a turtle. So he's <laughs> very slow and very methodical, except when he's writing music. When he writes music, he tunes into the universal broadcasting system and it just floods through. Mm. He writes th these incredible pieces of music. So at first it was a little bit of a challenge for us how to, how to work with each other's rhythms. But ultimately it has benefited us. It's helped me slow down. You know, sometimes I would have to go, Elizabeth, like, what is the damn hurry here? It's one thing when it's about an, you know, an idea. It's another thing. It's like, can you not get down the Sobeys aisle faster? Um, so it's helped me slow down and I needed to slow down. Um, so yeah, I, 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 that's, that's a little bit. Anything else you want to ask? I, I, I have a picture um, <laughs> that, uh, can, I, can I share a picture of yeah, you two? Yeah, sure. you can share them both if you like. Yeah. Okay, amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, wh where is this? When is this? So this was taken in 2018 in our backyard when we were living in Sackville, New Brunswick. Uh, my daughter Faith had come to visit and she took this picture. She actually also did my hair and makeup and those beautiful long earrings are hers. Beautiful. Uh, and we were on our way to a friend's wedding. So that was in our backyard in Sackville. Okay. I think there's maybe one more photo 
Let's check it out. Oh, we got the we got the <laughs> Irish wind in the in the skies. <laughs> so this was taken this past summer. So this was, of course, COVID came. We lost all our income. We were homeless for a while. Um, a lovely couple. You know, we relied on the kindness of strangers, and they gave us this lovely cottage for the summer, which was on the cliffs up near Grand Digue, New Brunswick. And this is um, us out having a little dance. I think it was on Thanksgiving. Oh, out on the cliffs. We like to go and dance. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, I appreciate that. I'm going to take off my Oprah hat. Um, make sure uh, you check out uh, Glenn's work. Uh, the uh, a link is in the chat. So um, I might not get to all of the questions at the moment, but um, I definitely wanted to start here. We have a we're we're joined by such a lauded and incredible uh, group of people from all over um, the world, really. Uh, but here locally, the amazing artist Bushra says, Elizabeth, can you speak more about your writing practice? You are such an incredible storyteller that I wonder if you write out loud. Oh, Bushra, thank you for that question. And thanks for coming, Bushra. Bushra is one of my oldest and dearest friends. Okay. Ah. Yeah. Um, yeah, sometimes I do write out loud. Um, I write I, I write on sketch pads. Like the part of my brain that can write a great persuasive letter, I can do that on a computer. But when the ideas are coming for me um, around this kind of work, for instance, the ideas come out of order. Um, they come with um, textures and colors. And so I have, you know, our house is full of all these great big sketch pads. And, we, and I have a space where I just have all my, my colored marker, markers. Um, and it is really out of order. It's really out of order. I love when I teach creative writing workshops to help people understand that the creative mind um, is much more chaotic. You know, the editorial mind, we all try to write and have our editorial mind taking it, take, taking in at first. It's, yeah. you know, the creative mind is very um, chaotic and thinks out of order. Does that answer your question, Bushra? <laughs> Sometimes. I wish, I, could, I, wish yeah. I could be in Shelly's hot tub with you right now. Let me tell uh oh. You. <laughs> me too, I think. <laughs> me too, I think. We'd invite uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Party people. Uh, in the chat, in the Zoom, feel free to put your questions in the chat, or you could uh, use the hand raise function, which is if you go over your name um, and you click on the three dots, you can use the hand raise function, or is there not a hand raise function? Um, or you can uh, ask to be unmuted and uh, you can ask the questions aloud. I have, uh, I, I, I obviously have so many questions um, and I, but I want to give a chance for our audience to uh, ask some questions, but as the questions are coming in, I'm wondering um, if there's one thing that the audience takes away from our discussions, from our readings, in regards to what they can do to contribute to this collective responsibility that's kind of been a theme throughout today. What can, what can uh, the everyday person do? What if they don't write poems? What if they don't write music? What if, um, you know, family and life are bogged, are, are, are bogged them down with time and scheduling? Um, yes. What sort of best practices can we each do to contribute to this collective responsibility. Yeah, so it's a key word that you said there, Ian, practice. It's to find, find some, some form of daily practice that feeds the inside so that when we are called upon to do the work in the outside, we are actually coming with some energy. So whether it's a meditation practice, a practice of you know, sitting with your favorite tree, um, if there were three words that I would give people to take away from this, uh, they would be reverence, mm. reciprocity, mm. 
and joy. Mm -hmm. And I'll just take this moment because it's a, it's a perfect segue into the workshop that's coming up that's starting next Saturday where we'll be going into these. So to answer your question, we'll be able to go into the, the more practicalities of what is my specific gift to this time? What is my particular gift? We Each of us have a particular gift to give to this time. And that's one of the things that we're going to be exploring in this workshop. Realize your power as an earth ally, which starts next next Sunday. That's amazing. Um, I'm just going to uh, give a little bit of liner notes about the workshop. Perhaps uh, we can uh, check out the workshop poster at this moment. Um, I'll also put the link for where you can get tickets in the chat. Uh, but the Arts for Change writing for Change workshop. Uh, there's three sessions of it, April 4th, April 11th, and April 18th. And uh, it's going to be uh, facilitated by Elizabeth. So if you liked anything that you heard today, if you want to find out more about their process and uh, really how to engage in those three words, reverence, reciprocity, and joy, make sure you check out the link in the chat. Um, it will be available for you. If you have any difficulties, the same place that you registered for this event is the same uh, area that you'll be able to find the workshop and get more of a deep dive in into the process. It's a three-part workshop series and the details are in the chat. Uh, we're going to get back to some more questions. Carrie, uh, Carly, sorry, um, Carly, are you, would you like to uh, read your, your question out loud? I can uh, un unmute you um, and uh, let's see hey, if Carly. we can. Okay, one sec <laughs> and there we go. Hello, Elizabeth. Hey, my friend. So nice to so see you. Nice. Yeah, likewise, likewise. <laughs> um, that was that was my joy hand. Uh, that is, yeah, this is making me very happy. Um, yeah, I've just been thinking. Uh, like, I mean, I feel like every as soon as I typed it, I was like, oh, is every artist getting asked this question? Is this just such a stock question these days? Of like, how has the pandemic impacted your practice? Have you been prolific? Have you been totally blocked? A bit of both, or just like. I don't know I guess just what's the like I think I think this time has been a really interesting one to to think about our own um habits and our own uh like arts practices and how it's not just about having more time necessarily um but also like uh yeah like the inspiration and the hopefulness the hope of like wow we're gonna come out of this and there will be a point to anything that I'm making so I guess I guess I'm interested just in sort of like how you've maintained hope in your practice in in your writing practice throughout this and how you imagine sort of like carrying that forward yes yes it's a great question so the poem that I read you a few minutes ago, Keys to the Treasure, was written in the early days of the pandemic. And essentially, it helped me not lose my mind. Um, one of the things that I often do when things are really hard is I ask myself, how can these times, how can this situation, how can this difficulty be my teacher? So I had posed this question to myself. How can this pandemic be my teacher? What is this pandemic here to, um, to offer us, me? So um, that first poem, it, 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 was a, it was sanity for me. The other thing that came as part of this pandemic, we didn't have a lot of time because we ended up, we moved three times in, in less than nine months. So there wasn't a lot of time to sort of sit around and think about things but what happened for me is that this book which i i wrote in you know i wrote it in 2018 and it was great and whatever and then i couldn't go on my tour with it in 2020 because it was cancelled 
But I began to go more deeply into this book and realize that through my own writing, and I can't take responsibility for the teachings that came through this writing, uh, a myriad of incredible teachings and teachers had been given to me, real teachings. There's a place in here where the three sisters rock say to me, trust that your life will not fail you. Trust that your life will not fail you. And I realize that I did not believe that my life would not fail me. So it's almost like there was a gestation of this work inside of me in terms of what the teachings um, gave to me. Does that answer the question, Carly? Yeah? Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much for uh, the question. Uh, we have uh, one more, um, and this is from Shauna or Shauna. Uh, would you like to uh, ask your question or I could uh, ask it? I just want to, you know, create a little bit of personal vibes and uh, get the interaction vibes going. I will ask the question. Uh, it says, Elizabeth, how do you feel that the place you live informs your writing? Example, do you feel writing might be different or the process different if you lived in a city or in a forest? Oh, yes. The, the place that I am in definitely always impacts my writing, for sure. You, yeah. do, can you talk a little bit about... Um, maybe a couple different places that you've been in and what you uh, see or uh, like the effect that is, has had on your writing? I just, I, I know that when I write, I, I know th the last time I was in Toronto, for instance, of course, what was speaking to me more was the incredible diversity in the city of Toronto, which I actually really miss out here. Um, and, and, and the music of hearing other, uh, other languages and other accents and, and all of those things. So it's what the particular place gives to me in a sensory way. Yes. Right. Yeah. Here in uh, Toronto, uh, everyone starts sounding like Drake. So I think it's all right that you're, uh, <laughs> that you're not around. Um, <laughs> We are nearing the close of our session. Um, I want to thank our, our sponsors, uh, of course, the Canada Council for the Arts, the Writers Union of Canada, the Ships Company Theater in Parsboro, Nova Scotia, and of course, the Rose Brampton, and all of you. Um, what I want you to also do is consider, if you do not have it already, to uh, take up a copy of Daring to Hope at the Cliff's Edge so that we can all have a piece of Elizabeth with us as we go through this pandemic. Um, the link will be in the chat box. Also, sign up for the workshop. Uh, there's three sessions of it, and it's going to be good for your soul, good for your heart, and give you some uh, inspiration on how we can become part of this collective community who is taking accountability and responsibility for the world that we are a part of. Dear Elizabeth, do you have any uh, closing remarks? I do. I do. I want to, first of all, thank you, Ian, for bringing your amazing self to this forum. You are an amazingly gifted young man, and I, I, I'm, I'm in total admiration of who you are. <laughs> I really appreciate it. And I want to encourage everybody, Ian has a book out, Black Abacus, and maybe, Ian, you can put to the link for your own book in the chat. And, um, yeah, I would encourage you, every time you buy a book, especially for poets, it's hard to make a living as a poet. Um, you really support the artist, so thank you. I want to acknowledge our Zoom tech support without which this um, event would have, have not been remotely as marvelous. So I want to thank Benoit, thank you very much, and Aaron and Richie here at Ship's Company, and thank the amazing um, Christina Akrong, 
who is the uh, Outreach and Education Director at the Rose Brampton. Thank you so much, Christina, for everything you've done to make this happen. Um, I want to say that if you felt any resonance with what we've shared here today, we are so glad. Yay. The rocks are glad. Gaia is glad. So I want to leave you with just the very end of the book. So this is part from part five, A Rebirth of Wonder. And it goes like this. 300 million years ago on the supercontinent of Pangaea, life conspired with rock, sea, and sky to dream a grand experiment. And so it follows that like the flow of Fundy's tidal bore, the green language of our young Ivan, and the sweet whisperings of my beloved weeping willow, I too am Pangaea's dream. Yes, I, the patience of the seed who trusts the dreamer's growing need to gestate in her womb of dark and thus distill a silent spark of wonder, rend asunder this empirical nightmare scheme. Yes, I, the thousand winds that blow, I, the silent evening glow, I, the pebble in the stream, I, the sunlight's constant beam, I, the rainbow in the sky, I, the tears of those who cry, I, the bursting leaves of spring, I, the song the green woods sing. Yes, I am Pangaea's dream. Whose dream are you? Thank you very much, everyone. Lovely, lovely. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this. It might get a little chaotic, but I'm going to unmute everyone. You can turn on <laughs> your videos and let's show our appreciation for Elizabeth through we can use our sounds we can use our hands oh yeah good vibes oh, hi robert yay. hi everybody hi, hi. hi. Thanks, thanks, thanks elizabeth thanks ian hey, yay. <laughs> yay. wonderful oh so Emily, good beautiful Bravo, bravo. Sarah, Leah, oh my god. Oh, thank oh, you. So Good hey, <laughs> hey, Shona. So great. Thank oh. you. Oh. Lots we're of officially is popping. <laughs> we're officially done, but I, I want to keep this uh this vibe open for a few moments. So uh, you know, we can feel free to uh chat over each other or uh say hello, show our puppies, our cats. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to translate the words I had written, Ian. It said Umsat Nogma, which is Mi'kmaq for all my relations, and Walalan to Elizabeth. Oh, Tara. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank so you. nice and to see you again. So lovely to see you. And everyone, this is Tara Francis. She's an amazing artist. Check her work out. It's so beautiful. It's it's a pleasure to see you, my dear. Thank you. As well. Thank you. And Shakira really enjoyed this. She sat here the whole time. Thank you. See her? Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Oh, it's really cute. Hi, Elizabeth. Fabulous <laughs> to see you. Big hugs, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. You're amazing. Thank you. Hey, Kurt. Hey, Sally. Thank you. For modeling what we are all needing to learn to heal the planet. Thank you so very much for envisioning and modeling a way to that healing. Thank mm. you. Evelyn. Beautiful words, Evelyn. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, party people. How are you feeling, Elizabeth? I'm feeling good. I'm feeling that this silence that has settled over now is is pregnant with possibility. Mm. Yay. Yes. Beautifully said. Yes, yes. I've had a smudge burning this whole time, Elizabeth. 
So as your words were flowing, the smoke from the smudge was flowing with it. Ah. And taking it out. Mm -hmm. Yes. Back yes. Into. Yes. Let us allow this energy to, to go out as a ripple in a stream does. Mm -hmm. Hi, Nadia. Hi, oh. Hi, my dear. Oh, hi, Beth. Hi. <laughs> oh. Human beings are so amazing. We are so innovative. We can find a new way forward based in the old ways, right? We did really well for the first hun several hundred thousand years we were here. And so all of that wisdom is in our cells. We can do this thing. Mm -hmm. We have to think in circles, not in up and down. Yes, mm -hmm. you're right, Lidvald. That's what renewal is. Exactly. Yes. yes. And it spirals and interconnects and it meshes and we're part of that, not separate. Yeah. Well, thank you for restoring some trust. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. We all need each other so much, right? There, there were some times in this past year when, when your kindness, Heather, helped restore trust for me at a time when I need it. So when each of us can hold space for the other, for the times when we can't hold it, that we hold it for each other. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's that collective. Yes. Yeah. I really feel that when enough of us love the earth as profoundly as you do, and we link our hearts together, when enough of us do that, I think we're going to see magic of proportions that we cannot even foresee. You know, a native woman one time told me that the healing of the planet, when we all turn ourselves to that kind of love to each other and to the planet herself, the healing will be so fast it will make our heads spin. And that's the hope that we have to hold. Yes. And you bring that to us and you unite people and your depth of spirit and your intensity of feeling bring that to us in such a visceral way that we cannot but respond. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you. Yeah, we are in a time, as Joanna Macy says, we are in a time of discontinuous change. Mm -hmm. So everything is moving quickly. So the mm -hmm. possibility for things to move quickly in very difficult ways we know is upon us. As the glaciers melt at, at speeds not predicted for 80 years. Um, but also the time for us to reclaim our, mm, can I call it magic? Can I call it miraculous? <laughs> Nature is upon us as well. And it can move quickly and together. If we can just break out of this consumer trance and get with each other. And the land. I've been reading a lot of Robin Wall Kimmerer. I just go to her book all the time. Mm -hmm. And she talks about, you know, when she was raised, how, you know, she was taught mm -hmm. to, to go to the tree people. You know, her grandmother said, you know, you're having trouble here. You need to go down and, and talk to the, the moss people. And of course, she has made her life study studying moss nice. and now is breaking all the rules in the academy that say, you know, she, she took her papers and said, uh, I want to tell you what the moss taught me. And in the academy, of course, the moss taught you. What do you mean, what the moss taught you? The moss can't teach you anything. And she said, hell's bells. No, this is what the moss taught me. That's right. So, yeah. Yeah. So we have to be reminded of the earth is our teacher. The animals are our teachers. The rocks are our teachers. The trees are our teachers. Yes. 
it's important. Yes. She also talks about, I'm reading about it now, animacy. Mm -hmm. Our language says that there's living things and dead things. Yes. And their language just tells us that everything is alive, everything. including the rocks. Yes. And therefore, we talk to them like we do to people. And if we start doing that, we change our thinking. And when we change our thinking, reality is different. That's and what she, magic is. And she tells us that in some um, native languages, the word for plants means those who take care of us. Mm. Oh, interesting. Oh. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> I was listening to a podcast the other day and um, they were talking about, you know, how do you instill gratitude within yourself that, uh, you know, there's a fine balance between um, it, happiness can be a genetically dis, dis, uh, passed down, um, certain levels of happiness, certain levels of happiness um, are your actions and what you do and, and how, um, how you think about the world and certain aspects of happiness are things that you can absolutely control and mm -hmm. going outside um, at least, you know, 20 minutes a day, every day uh, is helpful, but only specifically because of um, the, I, I don't know if it's enzymes, but it's a, it's a very specific kind of uh, biological um, output that trees give and emanate, and um, it actually brings uh, g brings up the serotonin in your in your mm -hmm. body. It yep. you know these are physical things that happen biologically to a human being, um, and so oftentimes you know we we hear of this work and we do think of it like those academics listening to someone talk about how they talk to moss. But uh, <laughs> I think it oftentimes it's the language that becomes uh, the disparaging factor between us understanding. And I think that uh, Elizabeth, your work does so well to use that language as a bridge to say, hey, we're not talking about different things here. We're talking about the same thing, uh, but all we need to do is start talking. Yes, yeah, so as I know we have to close in a minute, so I'm going to recommend two things to everybody. Um, Dirt, the movie. Dirt, the movie. It's an incredible film. It tells the science of the topsoil and gives the most incredible, hopeful mm. encouragement mm, that we can reclaim the topsoil. Earth can, re she can do a great job of mitigating the damage we have done within 10 years. Within So Dirt, the movie. Um, Diana Beresford Kroger's book, um, the um, call, call of the four. It's her newest book. Diana Beresford Kroger, um, also a botanist, um, and and of course Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass. So thank you all so much for coming today, and um, come to the workshop if you can, and otherwise have a blessed and and wonderful day, and. Uh, Thanks. Thanks, everyone.